Yeah, Hello, everyone. My name is Afik Abdelhamid, and I'm from Auckland University of Technology, currently doing my master's with the Institute of Radio Astronomy and Space Research. Previously in Malaysia, my background was in electronics engineering, majoring in microwave communication, so that was a lot of work with signals processing, but I've always wanted to pursue a life and career in astronomy, so that's what's brought me here. My presentation will be talking about some of the results from the discussion and the research that I've been having for my astro advanced topics in astrophysics paper under my supervisor, Dr. Willem van Straten, who is a member of the Institute for Radio Astronomy. Dr. Willem's research focuses on pulsars and accurately timing the arrival time of pulsar pulses from outer space. And with that, we take our first step out into the cosmos with that image right there that is an artist's rendition of a pulsar. What is a pulsar? Now, pulsars are stars that appear at the end of the stellar life cycle. When a star 10 to 20 times larger than the sun dies, it explodes and it becomes this really small compact object, about 10 to 20 kilometers in diameter, made out of neutrons. So imagine a star the size of Auckland City, but one tablespoon of which would, would measure out a billion tons. And mysteriously enough, these objects uh, emit beams of electromagnetic radiation along the magnetic axis as they spin periodically within a very strong magnetic field. I have a, an animation for you guys. And as this uh, beam is tracing out a pattern in Earth, and if, if Earth is caught inside that uh, path of the beam, it, this object becomes detectable as a radio source. Now these objects are very mysterious. They were discovered 50 years ago, but they represent nature and physics existing in cases of very extreme conditions that would be very hard to replicate in a laboratory here on Earth. They have their, they're made of very densely packed neutrons, matter packed together in smaller volumes than atomic nuclei, and they have very strong gravitational and magnetic fields, several million times stronger than that of planet Earth. Now that's pretty hardcore, but what are they good for? This is the Institute of Engineering Technology. They have to be good for something. Now that's a very interesting question, and it turns out that they're actually good for quite a lot. Well, first of all, their periodic rotation is very accurate to within a million trillionth of a second, so they make for very good celestial cosmic clocks. And uh, on longer time scales, they might be more accurate than atomic clocks, so in the future, we might be calibrating our watches on pulsar time. Uh, those beams actually act as a form of lighthouse that can be used for spatial navigation for deep space spacecraft, just like how lighthouses on Earth prevent ships in the ocean from getting lost. And the third application that I would like to emphasize on that I'll be talking about more is that they provide a test bed for us to test Einstein's theory of general relativity for gravitational wave detection. Now, there are many different types of pulsars that vary in terms of their rotation rate, and they all exist on this graph right here called a PT dot diagram that plots the instantaneous change of derivative logarithmic against the spin period logarithmic. Uh, all the pulsars exist on this graph, but I want to direct your attention to the fourth entry of this table and the lower left-hand corner of this plot. This is the domain of the millisecond pulsars, and they are very interesting because if you look at their spin periods, they are very fast, it's been two to three milliseconds they rotate. So within one second, this star is actually rotating 500 times. And that makes them very stable rotators. And we can use these stable rotators in experiments that we like to call pulsar timing arrays or PTAs. And uh, what we're doing is we're measuring the arrival time of these pulses, multiple millisecond pulsars from outer space and accurately measuring it so that we can uh, find the coherency between uh, multiple millisecond pulsars in an array and plot that as a function of their angular separation in outer space. Why would we want to do that? It sounds like a lot of space magic, but it's because we are in the pursuit of the ever elusive gravitational wave. And we're using pulse, pulsar timing arrays as a means of detecting perturbations in space time, so gravitational waves. And gravitational waves are these ripples in space time that propagate throughout, across the universe and they are caused by various astrophysical phenomena. One was made very popular last night, the black hole that was taken a picture of, uh, which I'll elaborate further on. Why, why do we want to hunt for gravitational waves? It's because two reasons, ladies and gentlemen. Number one, we want to get a new metric in which to study the universe beyond electromagnetic waves. We've, we've done that for the past 50 years. We want a new way to understand the universe. 
gravitational waves are one of them. And number two is we can make further refinements to Einstein's law of relativity, and this eventually gives us more accurate, precise GPS, eventually. Now, pulsar timing arrays, uh, they're very sensitive, very delicate experiments because we need to trace the arrival time of these pulsars to get a very accurate pulse profile and time of arrival. But you can think of these pulsar timing arrays as a, as a galactic scale interferometer. Now let's talk, take a minute to talk about interferometers. This is the LIGO experiment, billions of dollars in the United States, and we finally found a gravitational wave two years ago. We were measuring the strain factor of these arms by observing the, the wavelength, the change in wavelength as the gravitational wave was passing over these arms. It caused the light to become decoupled from destructive interference, and you get to see the lighting on the wall, as I like to say. This is the LIGO result that earned them the Nobel Prize in 2017. And of course, I had to take last night's image. Well, science is progressing really very fast. And uh, what are the causes of the gravitational waves? What causes this disturbances in space-time? It's these violent collisions in outer space caused by supermassive black hole binaries. When they merge in these events, they cause these perturbations of gravitational waves that propagate across the universe. And LIGO de detected gravitational waves. Now, moving forward with, with uh, my thesis in my master's coming next year, uh, I will be involved with pulsar timing array. And really what we're trying to do is we're trying to measure uh, this parameter very accurately. And we're trying to beat down the sensitivity curve of our timing residuals, which is our comparison between what the model predicts and what we uh, see at the observatory. And this is a little bit of math for you if you want to know exactly where I fit inside of here. My work inside the next two years will be right here in this little d parameter right here, which is dispersion. Because we want to accurately measure the arrival times that's made difficult by multipath fading of the interstellar medium. Now, as the pulsar wave travels throughout space, it interacts with the interstellar medium, and that causes these signals to become delayed <coughs> and causes some distortion in the signal. Now, you can think of this as um, <coughs> when you have a radio wave propagating through a parking lot and buildings. You, you, when you listen, when you try to listen to the radio in a parking lot, you get a really distorted and delayed signal, and that's exactly what is the same case with multi-path fading of the interstellar medium. You can, these gas clouds actually act as a bit of a screen that kind of interferes with the, the signals and that messes with the resolution of the signal profile and the time of arrival here on Earth. Right, so, so when, that happen, when that happens, this is an ideal pulse profile. It gets, the timing kind of gets stretched out like this and we get kind of a less accurate signal. And what, what my uh, traditionally uh, pulsar spectroscopy and we're trying to uh, break down these signals and understand them, involves a high flux and low flux to find the on-pulse and off-pulse time period. This is what we've been doing for the past 20 years. Um, what we do is we normally disregard the phase aspect of the signal, and we measure power at each frequency in order to acquire this thing right here is the power spectrum. This is called a filter bank channel that involves a Fox Fourier transform within bands, within certain bandwidths in the frequency domain and to produce this power spectrum of frequency versus time. But there's a problem with this method, and that is we are limited in a trade-off between resolution in the time or resolution in frequency. So it's either one or the other. So what my supervisor, Dr. Willem, has asked me to investigate is the application of, okay, uh, so for example, this thing right here, this is what we receive, this is what we want to receive, the red one. So what my supervisor has asked me to investigate is the method of cyclic spectroscopy. Uh, there are signals that exist as uh, cyclostationary processes, so imagine that these signals have um, statistics that vary periodically over time, that are comprised of multiple interleaved stationary processes. They exist in nature, um, sun, sunspot cycles, daily temperatures over 365 days, and they apply perfectly to pulsar periodicity. And this is a novel approach uh, applied by a radio astronomer from the United States named Paul Demers, and this task was handed down to me. And we regard the pulsar signal as uh, a, a cyclic signal right here. 
and as a signal that uh, is in this periodic correlation, we performed two FFTs on it, one, one in the tau, one in the T, and this is expressed by phase, to get a cyclic spectrum right here. And this method of application was actually, this method of spectroscopy was actually derived from engineering processes. When we listen to the sounds of engines inside a, a vehicle, we can actually, because it's repetitive, right, we can actually derive its nature from that. And this is, we want to derive the cyclic spectrum because it happens to give us better results than the traditional filter bank power spectrum. So this is the cyclic spectrum. You can see how we have more signal information because previously we, we disregarded phase. And by, by regarding the phase, you can tell that this image right here is less clear than this image. It preserves phase information, rescuing more signal content. And uh, an astrophysical benefit of this is we get to understand the impulse response of the interstellar medium, all that gas and dust in between here and there. Uh, we, have, we can understand the nature of that better by applying cyclic spectroscopy. Uh, now to bring it back down to Earth, to get back to the planet that started it all. Uh, this method can actually be applied to signal synchronization and telecommunication systems for prediction of financial markets and social cycles in queuing theory to predict behaviors of computer networks and car traffic analysis. And of course, the, the discipline that gave Mr. Paul Demers the in initiative to apply cyclic spectroscopy to the analysis of pulsar that is engine perturbations in mechanical systems. And of course, for we can study earthquakes and resonances in the ground using cyclic spectroscopy. Um, thank you very much. My mission going forward into my thesis next year, having my first semester right now, is in New Zealand for about a month now, uh, is to develop a filtering, processing pipeline for cyclic spectroscopy, and also to contribute to the literature of what is already known Thank you, IET, for your time. Uh, any questions? <coughs> that was fast, did I? <laughs> so, um, you talked briefly in your, uh, one of your last slides that you were using the theory of the movement that was going to start the debate from it. Is there a, um, yep, and down one corner. Would there be a, a reason that astrophysicists would, would want to use this tool as a way of um, seeing what's in the, the clouds in the sky? Or the moon, sorry? Like, could it be used as a movement tool like you use a telescope now? Mm -hmm. Okay, Tana, thank you for your question. Well, this thing actually, using the normal method, we already get that when we measure the, the pulse profile. Okay. But the limitation in the uh, power bank, filter power bank, is that we only get the magnitude response. Yeah. Uh, but with this cyclic spectroscopy, we can account for um, the frequency response. So we get a more detailed, uh, it's a form of holography, whereas the previous one, you're just getting a, a photograph of the ISF. If we use cyclic spectrum, we can actually get a holograph, a more in-depth kind of imagining of what the ISM is like. So this could apply to when we're timing pulsars that are really close, but there's a lot of gas and dust in between, or that are really far, and that there's not much in between. So that's one benefit that I can see. So how do you determine which pulsar is coming from which area? The diagram that you had on there shows each one relative to the Earth. Is it the angle of incidence that you're using to define which pulsar is coming from? Or? Okay. Um, to go back to that slide, the PP dot diagram, it's really a, one of the gifts of modern astrophysics. Uh, it, um, these are all pulsars. The younger pulsars start out their lives here, right? And their rotation rates kind of slow down until they cross this death line. We want to look at these. These are millisecond pulsars, and how they are born is that they, they have to kind of heat a, a binary in a form of stellar vaporism. So they are, there's a pulsar, and it kind of siphons mass, and these things spin up really fast, and they actually end up spinning. They can live for perhaps longer than the age of the universe, 100 giga years. But, and these are the ones that are such stable rotators. These are interesting. They have, uh, some of these are magnetars, 
which have very strong magnetic fields, but for this experiment, we're going to be operating in the field. How do you know which pulsar has the, the radiation that's on? Or is that not important? Uh, we're looking at just the period location. If it's a millisecond, because these are one second, what, what two to three milliseconds is what we're looking at. Uh, pulsars emit over a wide spectrum of radiation, X-ray, gamma ray, radio. I, I had that in my slides, but my supervisor told me to take it down because it's just, it's just not accurate. Yeah. Uh, one more question. I think you mentioned the computational power of the limitation. Mm. Um, can you see that changing in the near future? Is there some way that the um, advances in computing, whether it's That's, that's a good question because it ties into how we do uh, processing nowadays. Um, astrophysicists and HPC go hand in hand, high performance computing. We love high performance computing and they love us because we always bring them up to the table. Um, but I haven't really explored the full computational requirements of um, cyclic yet. But for now, this requires millions of FFTs in lots of bandwidth. And if you look at uh, the, the big uh, radio telescope arrays nowadays, uh, the ALMA, coming SKA, they all have these supercomputers somewhere. So it is kind of a symbiotic relationship. Um, we provide reason to have H high performance computing. They bump up the high performance computing, the high performance 